Hi, I'm Stephanie from museums.love. Today we're at the Kindle Center for Contemporary Art in Berlin. We're going to meet with the museum director, Katrin Becker, to see her current exhibition, The Invented History, which caught my eye for the interesting way it brings history and archaeology into the artworks of fantastic contemporary artists. The Kindle Center is young. It was opened as an art center just four years ago in 2016. But the building is much older than that. It was built in the 1920s as a beer brewery for the brand Kindle, which is still a very beloved kind of beer in the area today. The building's ultra chic renovation in the 2000s as an art center has drawn attention not only from world renowned artists and critics, but also from the local community. The Kindle Center has made it its mission to connect with the local community right here in Berlin Neukölln. This is difficult to do during lockdown, but that's all the more reason I'm excited to be able to show you today this intriguing exhibition here on museums.love. So without further ado, let's go inside to meet museum director and exhibition curator, Katrin Becker. Thank you very much for having us here today. And the first thing I'd like to ask you about is the title of the exhibition, The Invented History, which intrigued me already from the very beginning. Um, what do you mean by that? What does that mean for you? Well, you know, this is a, a, an idea that I had for quite a long time, but I think uh, it has a certain actuality at the moment. The invented history in the sense that we, here we talk about a critical historiography, yeah. uh, since uh, historical narratives, you know, um, in these days are often occupied or taken over by non-democratic maybe uh, forces all over the world including governments yeah. and uh, so I thought it has a certain urgency. In this exhibition we will see different approaches how artists deal with this idea of a critical historiography from working with the family archive for example or more documentary approaches a narrative that is uh, consciously hidden or consciously not talked about. Uh, maybe this describes already the general idea of the project. Absolutely. And what you're saying is, I think, really relevant and familiar for a lot of us who are reading the newspapers, um, especially as an American, um, Trump politics, but also the conspiracy theories that have been emerging in America, but also in Germany. Um, were those also some of the undercurrents that motivated you for the exhibition? Well, when we planned that exhibition, we were far from uh, the, the pandemic, so to say. At least, I mean, I didn't expect it and I didn't think about it either. But uh, I mean, of course, I mean, the idea of uh, of facts and truth and, uh, and, and things like that. I mean, when you talk about the Trump government, this was of course also somehow a catalyst uh, to, to really go then and, and, and do this exhibition. Yeah, amazing because um, with the pandemic now, um, the topics have become even more relevant, it seems, than even when you were in the planning stages. Yeah, Remar that's true. Remarkable. Yeah. Well, should we take a look at one of the artworks? And oh yeah, that's a good idea. Go in All more right. depth? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm excited to talk about this piece in particular because it has some special relevance to Berlin. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Oh yeah, this is a work by artist Nadja Kabilinke. She uh, has a very international biography, but she's based in Berlin. In this show, approximately 60% of the artists uh, live in, are based in Berlin, and the other half is based somewhere else. And uh, yeah, this is a piece called Altar Piece. What we see here is, um, uh, it's called a transfer print. Uh, of a facade of an above-ground bunker in Berlin on Reinhardtstraße, close to the close to the Friedrichstraße station, and actually this bunker has a very interesting history itself. It was born, uh, built in 1943 by forced laborers uh, uh, for approximately 2,500 civilians of the station. Then, after the Second World War, the bunker was used as a, a prison from the Soviet uh, secret police, the NKVD. Uh, and then, in GDR times, it was called the Banana Bunker, because it was a storage for uh, textile, but also for fruits. After uh, the collapse of the GDR, or after you, the German unification, uh, the Bunker was a techno club called Bunker. Today it is the home of the Boris collection uh, of contemporary art of the collector couple Boris. Nadja, she is uh, always working 
or always interested in terms of traces of history. And so what she did here was that she was doing this transfer print from a particular part of the bunker on the west facade where you can still see bullet holes uh, uh, and actually traces from the Second World War. And this is indeed a very uh, important aspect on the one hand to really show that history in the one or the other sense is always tailored from the leading, so to say, forces, from the leading figures. She used the altar uh, because uh, um, an altar also is a, a tool or an instru instrument for remembrance. And that's why she chose to do this uh, piece as an altar piece. The gold is so remarkable. Yeah. Um, I don't know, have you been able to close the... Well, actually, I mean, generally speaking, uh, there is no fixed position of the wings, so you could also imagine a different, so to say, uh, ins installation of the work. But since it is real, we thought, like, we don't have it as an interactive work right. that you cannot touch it. <laughs> I love that because also in medieval uh, triptychs or uh, Baroque triptychs, what's on the outside is, as, is exactly as important as what's on the inside. Yeah. And I, I love the way it's layered. Yeah. You can have a lot of associations. Uh, if you think about the bullet holes, you can also think about the wounds of, uh, of Christ, for example. The artist in this case herself talks about archaeology or um, one time described her work as being an archaeology of contemporary life. Um, do you see that in this piece or does that resonate for you in some way? Yeah, it does resonate. And you see this idea of uh, dealing with certain traces of the past or this what is called the art of memory, which is a phenomenon in contemporary art that goes back to at least the 90s, if not 80s, 1980s, uh, is of course something that I also wanted to embrace in this project, you know, so you're perfectly right. Uh, cultural memory is something that comes up a lot in archaeological studies too, so it's fascinating for me again to see the parallels between the studying of antiquity and the studying of contemporary life, how similar they really are. Yeah. This piece also plays with time, as we were talking about before. Could you tell us a little bit about what the artist is doing here? Yeah, this is a, a piece that kind of deals with the future history. There are two works in the show that have this approach. This is an artist, uh, Yael Bartana, an uh, artist born in Israel, based uh, in Berlin and Amsterdam. And actually, uh, what we see here are fossils of weapons. The title uh, of the works are uh, um, in accordance to that, rest in peace, Kalashnikov, rest in peace, Smith & Wesson. I never can distinguish what is Utsi, what is Kalashnikov, <laughs> what is so-and-so, and I deliberately try not to learn it. That's enough. right. That's right. <laughs> Weapons are so last millennium. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, this uh, work uh, belongs to a larger body of work that uh, Yael Bartana realized in 2019. Um, first of all, it is based uh, back uh, to a performance that she did, which is called Bury Our Weapons, Not Our Bodies. Um, and uh, actually, this performance led to a film that was t uh, called, or is called, actually, The Undertaker, where you see a, a cemetery in uh, Philadelphia, the Laurel Hill uh, Cemetery, which has some kind of military importance because uh, there are a lot of graves to victims of the Civil War. Uh, and, uh, of course, she also deliberately chose Philadelphia as the breeding ground, so to say, of American democracy with uh, 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 both the declarations of independence and the uh, constitution in the 18th century. And, uh, okay, in this film, The Undertaker, you see a real funeral ceremony where uh, kind of a, a, a group of people brings those weapons to the graveyard and they are then buried into the ground. And here, um, these, uh, these uh, objects, they are uh, kind of fossils of those weapons, as if this process of kind of burying the weapons already happened quite some time ago. And now we have also only fossils of the weapons. So she speaks actually about 
a, a, a new history in the future, so to say. A di so she, she speaks about a time when weapons are obsolete. The fossils um, are, uh, look as if they've been rediscovered in a future time in which um, maybe human civilization looks very different and maybe uh, it is even wiped out entirely <laughs> because of the very weapons that are shown. Maybe, maybe it's an act of artificial intelligence to finally, I mean, get rid of, <laughs> get rid of these weapons. So now we can look at some of the photographic work in the exhibition. Um, these are interesting again out of the archaeological perspective in which maybe the photographs themselves are the archaeological material that's being interpreted. Um, do you think that's accurate and what is this project meant to tell us? Yeah. This is a work by artist uh, Mariam Jaffrey, an artist born in uh, Karachi in Pakistan and based between Copenhagen and uh, New York. And she, uh, yeah, in her work, she deals a lot with questions of representation of politics, representation of uh, power. And here, this is a work that particularly deals with the question of copyright. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Mariam realized that uh, she, she discovered photographs uh, in the, uh, belonging to the copyrighted by Getty images. Uh, of uh, some historical, important historical moments of the Ghanaian independence in 1957. Um, and she also realized that there are different versions uh, of the same, same type of photographs uh, that uh, she found in the uh, archive or that are cooperated by the Ghanaian Ministry of Information. And so her question is not so much what is the true version or what is uh, fake or what is uh, uh, yeah, a kind of a wrong interpretation of the moment, but she deals here more with the question of uh, how national heritage can be copyrighted by different, so to say, powers and different forces. Um, actually, we see here always the two versions of one and the same scene, and below we, see, we have a text where uh, the, the historical scene or the historical moment is uh, described. Mm -hmm. So that also um, um, a viewer that would maybe not rec recognize uh, what we see on the photograph, like I guess most of us, uh, uh, is informed about what, what, what the scene is about. And then you see that, uh, yes, there are all these uh, uh, kind of typical um, um, yeah, methods of uh, manipulating an image. You kind of uh, 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 kind of use only a, a detail, or you um, give it more sharpness, or you blur certain parts, and so on. Until today, photography plays a certain role in uh, the sense of uh, an instrument for documenting um, history or documenting also our reality. Uh, and though kind of we know that uh, there is also no truth to photography, we easily can be manipulated. Uh, and I think nowadays even more when, uh, I mean, due to the digital technology. Even though we're familiar now with Photoshop and filters, um, Instagram filters, uh, even so there seems to be a general belief that photography captures something objective. The photography itself, you know, it is of course a found footage, if you wish, a found material, not a material that she, for example, invented or that she kind of uh, photographed herself. And uh, so it is, I think, a very kind of conceptual approach towards photography as such. The issue of copyright is something I think uh, too many of us have to know about for, for our jobs these days. Um, but to see that copyright really can affect a national heritage, a national cultural heritage, is something that I had never considered before. Um, that opened my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent do you think copyright um, really influences national heritage, maybe in other countries or also in other media? Well, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't reduce the problem to the issue of uh, copyright, you know, and I, I would like to open the field towards uh, what, what we call now restitution, yeah, restitution politics, yeah. This idea of, uh, um, uh, for example, the Western world to be the world to uh, 
uh, take care of those uh, objects that were stolen from uh, the Global South during colonial times, for example, is uh, an issue that um, uh, I, I think in some sense is also touched uh, here. This is maybe something that uh, uh, I would like to also people to think about. Thank you so much for having us today and for showing us some of these artworks in depth. I'm really pleased to have been able to be here and thank you for taking the time. Yeah, thank you. Also, thanks for your interest in that show and in that subject. Thank you. As you can see, the invented history addresses issues that are relevant to us today, like the subjective nature of history, and especially relevant to the local community, which is as international as the artists here. You can find out more about the importance of engaging local audiences on museums.love. I'll see you there.